welcome to the seventh webinar in InGuardian's webinar series. Today, we have Robert Curtin Seifert presenting on our purple team assessment and training as a primer and a roundtable discussion. Rob? Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Uh, as Mike said, um, my name is Robert Curtin Seifert. I'm a senior security analyst here at InGuardian's. Um, prior to InGuardian's, I spent uh, some time in the military as well as in the financial industry um, as a security analyst and consultant there. Um, I am joined by an awesome list of panelists and the first panelist that I'd like to introduce themselves is none other than Mr. Mike Poor. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Rob. Uh, so I'm Mike Poor, founder and president uh, of InGuardians. Uh, we have been uh, running in Guardians, uh, a services company here uh, for uh, just over 14 years. Uh, and uh, I, I also spent about 15 years uh, heading up the intrusion detection track uh, at the SANS Institute. Uh, and uh, I have uh, just over 25 years of experience in consulting uh, with my primary focus being on uh, breach detection and analysis and incident response. Awesome, thank you, Mike. Uh, my next panelist is none other than Mr. Larry Pesci. Would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely, Rob. Thanks. Uh, so my name is Larry Pesci. I'm the director of research, uh, as well as uh, wearing a number of other hats uh, at InGuardians. Um, I have uh, uh, lots of experience in a prior life uh, in uh, uh, higher education uh, and uh, healthcare, uh, with about a decade uh, in each. <laughs> Uh, and uh, have spent uh, the last you know, more than a decade doing uh, uh, security consulting across a number of uh, industries, in uh, some cases uh, yeah, across the broad scope, uh, and as well as uh, specifically in, in some roles uh, looking uh, at uh, power systems uh, uh, groups of all the various flavors. So, thanks, Rob. And uh, Jared, uh, would you uh, care to introduce yourself? Well, let's uh, move on to Dave uh, Mayer. Thanks, Mike. This is Dave Mayer. I'm a senior security consultant within Guardians and uh, operate on some of our purple team engagements that we have with Rob and Jared and the rest of the team. Uh, came from both a financial background and a healthcare background before joining in Guardians. No. Thank you, Dave, and sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, last but not least, uh, Thomas, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, thanks, Rob. My name is Thomas Hutchison. I'm a security analyst here at InGuardians, and I've spent the last uh, decade working in IT and security, ranging from startups to large global enterprises. Uh, I've worked in different industries like aerospace, both in the commercial and defense side, uh, healthcare, as well as industrial manufacturing, where I started specializing in areas of system administration, DevOps, incident response, and uh, web application pen testing. Awesome. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so, like Mike said, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Purple Team Assessment and Training from InGuardians. Um, and we're going to talk about an overview of what Purple Team Assessment and Training is, uh, Purple Team Assessment Operations, how does it work, um, what to expect when you get an InGuardians Purple Team and how to prepare and what to look for when you're choosing your next Purple Team Assessment and Training Provider. So first and foremost, what is a Purple Team Assessment, assessment and Training from Guardians? Well, we developed a, a unique red versus blue training program that could be customized to your organization, right? Um, we assess and, and aim to help you guys bolster your incident response capability and we conduct live fire exercises um, against your infrastructure with your team uh, to help you guys get better detection, um, better deterrence, and a better response to these live fire um, attacks. 
Um, some of the key factors here at and Guardians, uh, we like to focus on that it's a custom training, 100% developed for your organization as well as your environment. This is a collaborative testing, uh, meaning that we work together um, to not only you know, conduct these live fire uh, attacks, but as well as bolstering your response to helping aid you guys at, at the organization in detecting, um, deterring, and ultimately breaking these uh, attack chains. And it's modular, um, meaning that we cover multiple different aspects uh, of the attack chain. Um, so the overview of the purple team assessment and training is again when we we start to, uh, to build the purple team assessment training for your organization the first thing we do is we look at your organization and we customize it so we send out a questionnaire uh, to you guys uh, to the, the uh, organization and we take that data and we customize it to you guys and we build the infrastructure um, around that to best help and train um, for your environment. Um, and we actually execute on, um, on the purple team assessment and training. We test the following areas. We, we test the edge, we test payload execution, privilege ask and lateral movement, post exploitation, and detection and response. Uh, Dave, um, can you expand on the edge testing and why we do it and how we conduct it. Sure. Uh, so for the edge testing, we typically begin with sending in emails from a known email address that was set up for the engagement. Uh, start with sending in a, attachments to emails so that they come in and start testing your spam filters, mail filters, mail antivirus to see what is detected, what isn't detected, and what evasion we can do and work with you to tune your systems at that point uh, so that you can hopefully catch 100% of the payloads coming in. Uh, after that, we'll move on to sending in malicious links uh, to see if they're blocked or allowed, uh, depending on what solutions you have in place. And then after that, we'll work as well on testing whether we can use your mail servers as a mail relay to send in emails spoofed as they're coming from within the organization and some other purge further edge testing on just what we can do to get in. And this is really to simulate and emulate the what we see in a lot of the large scale attacks where somebody either clicks on a link that comes in through an email or receives a malicious document. So that's really where we want to start with on our testing, uh, just like any other attack path would be. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Dave. Um, Jared, do you want to talk about how we test and why we test uh, the payload executions? Sure. So when we talk about payload execution, we're talking about a, a fair range of things. This is, uh, this is a rarely but occasionally exploit code, uh, what you, you normally think of uh, for some of the vulnerabilities. Um, in many cases, we're looking at command execution. Uh, PowerShell, both explicit uh, and using some of the uh, some of the sort of hidden means of uh, executing PowerShell, so that uh, you know we're looking to see how effective your whitelists are, um, how effective your detection means are. Uh, for non-Windows systems, we're looking at uh, we're looking at ways that we can uh, that we can execute code on. Uh, Linux, um, Max, AS400, um, a pretty wide range of things, and then seeing what sort of uh, artifacts are left behind that can be used to help um, to identify those or see what kind of gaps are there. Um, some of this is, is anti-malware. Uh, some of this is log detection. Some of this is what goes up to the SIM. Um, and sometimes we're also looking to see, are there just raw gaps that... Uh, that there may be cases where you can't detect them at all, and if that's the case, how do we sort of put up walls, help you put up walls around those gaps? Um, we're looking at, at uh, we're looking at ways of, of obfuscating, uh, you know, changing how the the actual payload looks to see can you detect it uh, when we send it raw? Okay, can you detect it when we have changed what it looks like? 
um, and then can you identify it afterwards uh, so that you're not relying on just when the payload actually executes, but you're looking at uh, clues that come later on in the execution so that maybe you can uh, you have a chance at catching something that you missed the first time around. Awesome, Rob. Thank you, Jared. Um, so when we, we, we look at privilege escalation and lateral movements, um, it really depends on where we land in your network or, or what permissions are on the workstation that we actually get ex code execution on. Um, if we do privilege escalation first or we do lateral movement. Um, but if we, when we're looking at doing privilege escalation, we're looking at, you know, is there any sort of configuration issues on this one workstation? Um, you know, is there creds and and your plain text on the desktop? Is there, um, can we hijack a DLL? Can we piggyback on some other process running a system? Um, and, and we we help you guys detect that uh, by looking at the logs that are generated on the local workstation. Now, when we're talking about lateral movement, um, you know, it's moving from one workstation to the next workstation or from workstation to server or server to server. And we're literally testing um, if we can go from a workstation in one area to workstation in another area, or can we go from this one workstation to uh, your servers, and can we abuse the, the network trust that you guys have? Um, can we use PS exec? Can we use um, WMI and how to detect uh, those types of movements across your network? Um, so we're, we're not only looking at just how can we escalate to a local administrator on this box, but can we move uh, with the permissions we have or the escalated permissions up to another box and gain another uh, credentials or get some of the sensitive information off of those workstations. Larry, uh, would you like to walk us through post exploitation? Sure, absolutely. And, and you know, thinking about after we've gone through all of these steps, uh, you know, we want to be using some of the same techniques, tools, tactics, and techniques, and and all of those types of things that uh, an attacker would be using, uh, including performing all of those sort of post exploitation uh, activities. Um, you know, looking within the file systems um, themselves, looking within the the systems that we have gained access to as part of this this exercise and, and this training event, um, to to see if there's something that we can find that would allow us to move deeper into the environment, uh, provide for additional lateral movement. Um, provide additional credentials to access other types of systems through different applications uh, and so forth. You know, typical sort of post-exploitation. Um, absolutely with the intent of using unusual methods or users that shouldn't normally be accessing these types of uh, these files or these breadcrumbs, as it were, um, across the systems to determine whether or not you can detect that someone has accessed something that they wouldn't normally, uh, and or whether or not you know some of those types of things exist on those systems that you should consider uh, providing a little bit more due diligence uh, for some detection capabilities on. Back to you, Rob. Awesome. Thank you, Larry. And lastly, all this bolsters into detection and response. So with all these layered approaches uh, that we take in testing and uh, help, and finding detection and responses, uh, it all goes holistically into bolstering the detection and response of your organization as a whole um, to help you guys not only prevent some of this, but to increase your time to detection, uh, which ultimately increases uh, your response time to these. Um, so one of the most important things uh, is what a purple team assessment and training is not. It's not conducted by a lone individual. Uh, there's a lot of time and effort that gets put into this. So it's very much a team effort on our side and a team effort uh, from the organization that's bringing us in. Um, it is not adversarial in nature. We're working together uh, to try to bolster the detection and response time 
of the organization. Um, so it's very much a, a we effort. Uh, it's not a red team or an internal penetration test. While we are conducting, you know, attacks against your network, it's not a comprehensive at, um, attack. It's very targeted. And what we do is we we try to focus on bits and pieces of of the overall attack to help you guys bolster um, your detection and your response time. And due to the fact that it is not conducted by a loan operator and it is um, very time intensive, it's, it's not inexpensive. So to bring us in, it's not inexpensive. Um, so what to expect from a purple team assessment and, and training? Sorry, Mike, did you have something? Uh, yeah, I was just, just, just going to kind of point out a couple of different things, you know, uh, one of the primary differences, I think, about an Guardian's purple team assessment and training uh, is that we are focused on assessing and training your blue team members into having, one, a better security posture, to teach them about the adversarial mindset uh, techniques and, and procedures, uh, and to improve their capabilities uh, at detecting, responding, and hunting. Uh, you know, we all know that that, you know, our networks and systems are constantly under attack, uh, constantly being barraged by you know the latest and greatest uh, exploits, all the way back to to ancient ones as well. Uh, and uh, and our hunting and our detection and our response capabilities uh, have to be on par, or else we're going to be losing the war. Uh, so so the whole purpose, uh, uh, you know, uh, as we see it, for for a purple team is really to to uh, to assess uh, your blue team's capabilities. Uh, both in defending, uh, deterring, and detecting, responding, and hunting uh, uh, threats on your network, uh, and uh, then giving you a, a roadmap uh, for taking your blue team to that next level. Uh, so that, that was one of the things that, that I wanted to mention here, uh, you know, kind of as one of the big differences about, you know, what is a, a, a purple team versus, you know, a, a red team uh, and, and other types of penetration tests, for example. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 when we look at, at, at the attacks uh, that we choose, uh, uh, of course, we're not just uh, testing, uh, you know, uh, phishing and spear phishing, uh, but at the same time, we're absolutely going to test them. Uh, of course, we're, we're going to be testing uh, the execution of payloads uh, against your systems, uh, you know, including uh, many of the payloads uh, and, and techniques that we see uh, when we respond, uh, you know, to serious uh, incidents on a regular basis, right? You know, so while our, our, our offensive security team uh, is conducting red teams uh, or our, our incident response team is going in and helping clients recover, you know, from a serious breach, for example, uh, we're collecting data, we're analyzing payloads, we're, we're looking at the techniques that are being used by uh, the attackers to get in uh, to networks and to, to establish a, a foothold on those networks. And, and, and then the whole purpose of a purple team is to take those those advanced techniques, take those payloads, the the, the methods of execution, the methods of, of maintaining access, the the methods that they use to pillage the village and post exploitation uh, and, and hide their tracks, uh, and then turn that into a, a method for assessing your organization's capabilities to withstand those attacks, and a, a method for training your team to do better. Uh, and, and you know, uh, you know, as Rob said, to, to reduce that time, uh, you know, to detect uh, and deter, uh, so that you know your systems can get back up and running, uh, or you know, not get pwned at all, you know, in, in an ideal world. Uh, back to you, Rob. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Mike. Larry, I, I have a question for you here. Uh, with that caveat that that Mike brought up is. Um, one of the questions we get is, how does the purple team training differ from tabletop exercises often conducted, uh, you know, in disaster recovery and business continuity exercises? Can you speak to that? Absolutely. Thanks, Rob. Uh, so coming from some of my history and and specifically my, my work in healthcare, uh, what, some of my role there uh, was very much being responsible for their uh, IT, the information technology, information services, uh, disaster recover and business continuity plan. Uh, 
Uh, and what I found in that environment was that we had similar types of things in that we had something that we needed to test this disaster recovery plan, as it were. Um, and we had the capabilities for doing uh, system failovers and switches and migration of data and verification that all these things were happening in real time. You know, all these things happening in real time, very similar to some of our security operations. And we had this process and we had this, this set of objectives, but no one ever really wanted to actually flip the switch to take the system offline and have it fail over. So we always did that via a tabletop exercise with a whole lot of what ifs. And let's pretend that this system is down. Does it really work when we go to connect here? And it wasn't always a really accurate test. And one of the things that I think with that, that is incredibly valuable that isn't found often in these types of scenarios, the disaster recovery uh, and or the business continuity plan testing with a purple team assessment and training is that we are doing actual attacks. We are performing actual pivoting. Uh, we're actually performing all of the things as an attacker would in real time and giving you the opportunity to react and respond in real time. It is very much a collaborative type of event and actually performing said actions. And those actions will change over time at, to determine the level of readiness. So I think that's one of the big things is that it is very much a collaborative type of event and it is actually being conducted. You know, we're actually slinging packets as it were. Thanks Rob. Awesome. Thank you for answering that for me, Larry. Um, so the next thing we we'll talk about is what to expect from a purple team assessment and training. Well, the first thing is paperwork. Um, we got to clearly define the rules of engagement uh, for this purple team assessment and training due to the fact, as Larry said, we're actually slinging packets around. Um, Jared, um, can you give us an example uh, of or talk to why defining the rules of engagement is very important? Yeah, so um, I, I'm going to reach back to my, uh, my early years in InfoSec. Um, uh, I've got about uh, 15 or so years in InfoSec right now, and going back to when I was on the defensive side, um, the rules of engagement are important because it sets down what you can go after and what you can't go after. Um, and there are a number of reasons for these. Sometimes the the things that you uh, that you go after are because they are the the crown jewels, so to speak. Um, there are times that uh, you don't want um, somebody going after something because it hasn't been fully deployed. Um, it is known to be especially uh, especially sensitive to being touched, so you want to be very, very careful about how you do it. Um, there are um, there may also be situations where if it goes down, it can bring about something catastrophic. One of the classic ones uh, that we've run into in the past and that um, I ran into as a defender was uh, the payroll system getting knocked over while it was running payroll. And that makes for a lot of very upset people um, when they don't get their paychecks on time. Um, leaves accounting scrambling to, to get things done. Um, knowing what you're going after and what you're not going after, uh, or what you're looking at, what you're not looking at, is also important from a general resource perspective. Um, you want to know what you have to work with. Um, if there is a sort of dark corner of your network, um, that can be problematic in trying to address from a purple team perspective because you don't know what kind of resources you have to work with. If you have no knowledge of what's going on, um, then you're really operating in the dark and just sort of guessing at what might actually be effective. Um, when you do that, it ends up detracting from the areas that you know better that you can get a better overall return from during the engagement. Um, it's not uncommon for uh, for more than one purple team to happen over over a period of time. Uh, you, you finish up one, you you identify the resources that you need or the changes that need to be made, and then you come back later and you do it again on an area of the network that you weren't quite so familiar with or that just was plain out of scope for whatever the reason happens to be. Awesome, thank you, Jared. 
Um, the other part of, of the paperwork is getting the contracts in place early. Um, as we've already discussed, uh, Purple Team assessments and training takes a lot of time to customize. We have to set up all the infrastructure. And, and so getting the contracts in place early is key to getting a, a very value out of uh, this Purple Team assessment and training. Um, another thing is we want to identify and empower uh, a single point of contact to complete, to complete the pre-assessment tasks. Um, and those pre-assessment tasks could be something as simple as setting up a conference room um, that has enough space for everybody, um, making sure we have a projector, um, you know, make sure we have the right address, we have the dates correct, and being the advocates at the organization to ensure that, that this is, runs as smooth as possible. Another thing is inform the necessary, uh, necessary parties. Um, and, and ensure that, that they have time um, and are present during this assessment and training. Uh, Thomas, what, what is the importance of having representation um, from all levels of information technology and InfoSec groups while conducting a Purple Team? Thanks, Rob. Yeah, I, I've spent time in organizations where the, the approach to security has started from the bottom up as well as been pushed down from the executive leadership. You know, interesting issues can certainly arise in each approach. From the bottom, there can be a lack of executive buy-in, and when forced from the top, uh, it has been my experience that there can be a disconnect between what goals or tasks need to be achieved and having the resources and skill sets uh, necessary to accomplish those goals. So, and, and team allows for all the stakeholders to be identified and provides a unique opportunity to promote collaboration and understanding of the various hurdles that they all have to deal with. And that being said, uh, I think there is a more functional answer to this question, and it's just to provide an opportunity for greater success because you have the necessary resources to answer the appropriate question and execute on the tasks that would be required. Uh, in, in example, um, th there, there was an attack path being explored where we found a, a vulnerable device that, uh, that we were ready to exploit. Uh, we had gotten the green light to, to exploit the device uh, live when uh, you know, our team asked uh, what the function of this device was. Uh, it was uh, it was a fully operational production environment, so we wanted to proceed with caution, of course. At the moment, no one from the network team, workstation team, server team, and, and InfoSec had an answer until an individual from the help desk noted that it was a CAT scan machine, and perhaps we should find another device to exploit. So this 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 is this uh this shows that it's it's so crucial to have uh, everybody in the room that that can provide the appropriate insight, and it also echoes uh, as to why it's so important to. Uh, that there is clearly defined rules of engagement. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Tom. Um, when one of the best things about having a purple team assessment and training is when recommendations that, you know, a, a pen test company or security company or even your own internal security company has made um, comes to life when we break down uh, of the attack and how to detect and deter that. Um, Dave, can you give a, a good example of once when uh, one of our recommendations came to life um, and how we showed them how it broke down, how the attack actually worked and how to mitigate that attack? Sure. Uh, so on one of our purple team engagements, we were walking the client through uh, an, an attack path on the path to gaining privileges within the domain. And we were able to utilize a, a vulnerability that had been posted within the past few months. It was still relatively new, but less than six months old at this point. And we walked the client through the exploit path of being able to go and gain privileges on the system uh, and then gaining those privileges and then working through to remove them and return the environment to the state in which we found it. Uh, we let the client know there's been a patch that was issued for this when they were unaware of that patch. So they actually went and went through their process quickly uh, to go and install the patch on just one of the servers to verify that it fixed the issue. Uh, got it installed and we came back, circled around about two, three hours later, 
um, and ran through the same attack path again. And they, we were able to show them that just by installing that patch and keeping up to date on the patches available for those specific systems that they were able to remediate that vulnerability and kill that attack path that was no longer viable within the organization. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dave. Um, like, like we said, uh, Purple Team assessments and training take a significant amount of time and resources, but not just from our, our time and our resources, uh, but your time and resources as well. Um, so we want um, to make sure that, that the appropriate people are there, like we said, and that they have blocks of time um, set aside to come in and work with us and receive this training and and view the assessment that goes on. Um, another thing is that the Purple Team assessment and training just doesn't involve a list of vulnerabilities that we we go down and, and check and then help you guys remediate. What we focus on is the attack path, the the full from code execution to complete network compromise to taking all the uh, PII or, or um, data you guys that uh, the organization doesn't want to be exposed or, or taken or proprietary data and we break down the the attack path to that and their mediations um, mitigations and detection points all along that path so that we can um, collaboratively increase your security posture. So how do you prepare for a purple team assessment and training? Well, the first thing is to ensure your, your SIEM or your log aggregation system that you guys have is gathering the appropriate logs and the stakeholders have the access. We want to make sure that the, the security appliances are up to date and, and working. And again, the appropriate stakeholders have access and we want to ensure the appropriate change control requests are in place prior. Um, Mike, can you talk to about uh, what is the biggest mistake you see when organizations are deploying monitoring systems and how can they detect that prior to a purple team? Oh yeah, that's a great question, Rob. You know, one of the things that, that, that I, I've seen, you know, over time is that organizations are often uh, quick to deploy a solution without thinking about why they're deploying that solution. So for example, you know, the, the, regu the regulators or auditors say, thou shalt have a, a seam to aggregate all your logs, uh, or, you know, thou shalt have an intrusion detection system, for example. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so, you know, as quickly as it takes, you know, to, you know, click on, you know, a, a link and purchase something or, or, you know, talk to a vendor, um, you know, they have a system up and running and they've satisfied that auditor or regulators, uh, uh, concerns, uh, but the problem is, is that oftentimes it didn't really buy them anything other than uh, a management headache, uh, or you know, where do I store all the data? So one of the things that that you know, I've always recommended, uh, and in Guardians is, is recommended to our clients when we're deploying uh, intrusion detection systems or log aggregation uh, and analysis systems, uh, for example, is to uh, first identify the most critical systems for your business to stay in business. Uh, you know, do a true risk assessment. Identify uh, the systems that are critical for you to stay up and running. Uh, you know, whether that, that you know, involves your emails or whether it involves, you know, servers uh, that, uh, that are, are customer facing, uh, whether that, you know, involves the, the AS400 uh, that, that, that are, you know, uh, aggregating your financials, whatever it might be, identify those. And those are, are the first systems that you want to make sure that your that your seam, uh, your log aggregation and correlation system and analysis system uh, can handle. Uh, then, uh, you know, establish a baseline. That, that's the second thing that, that I, I see so many times organizations kind of skip doing or, or, or don't know how to do, for example, is how do I actually get a baseline for what uh, events I, I should normally see uh, and what events, uh, you know, should really raise the red flag? You know, because from a, a consumer of intrusion detection alerts, right, you know, that system is telling you that everything that you're seeing is bad, you know, and, and some organizations are getting, you know, millions of events a day, uh, you know, which, of course, they can't respond to. So uh, being able to, to, one, identify the systems that are critical to your organization 
staying afloat and staying in business uh, and making sure that those uh, systems logs are getting into the aggregator and processed correctly uh, to establishing a proper baseline for uh, what is quote unquote normal and, and, and thusly everything else is considered to be really, really interesting. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also to have that mindset. Uh, the, the last thing that, that I'll speak to here is that uh, oftentimes uh, we, we instrument the networks, we get everything up and running, we, we get all these systems talking to each other, uh, we put uh, you know, a few analysts on, on a team uh, responsible for analyzing these things and determining whether they, are, they constitute a, a serious threat, for example. But then we don't teach them what to do once they find it. Uh, so, okay, great, you found this you know, big, bad, evil attack number seven. Uh, well, what do you do from there? Uh, and, and this is going to differ from network to network and, and organization to organization. Uh, and, and I think that's one, one area that Inguardians, uh, you know, or, or conducting a purple team uh, assessment and training uh, can really help with uh, is, uh, you know, essentially help train your people on what procedures to do once they find something. Uh, and, uh, you know, whether that's just reporting it up to the chain to, to, to tier three and then have tier three. Uh, and act upon that, uh, or you know, or, or if it's uh, uh, you know issuing change control tickets to uh, you know change you know application firewall or whitelisting or otherwise, uh, or, or or something more serious. Uh, those are the three three big ones for me, Rob. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Uh, Dave, do you want to talk about why it's a, uh, like having the change control request or modify the change control? Uh, for the purple team assessment and training is important. Sure. Uh, so a lot of, when we come in to do the purple team, we not just do the the attacking of systems to demonstrate uh, issues that need to be remediated, uh, but we'll also work with you to help you put in rules and alerts on your SIM or correlation system um, or your various different systems, maybe one part's alerted from one system and one part from another, but we'll work with you to get those alerts configured so that they'll actually trigger and then we'll go ahead and test them to make sure that they're working properly and there's been times where we run into issues oh we can't make changes on that system uh we need to run that through change control and we'll be able to do it next week and unfortunately we're only there for a limited amount of time to work side by side with you to get that rule tuned and make sure it's working 100 percent properly for your environment so having the proper change control and approvals ahead of time to be able to work with us to make the changes for rules and alerts on the fly will help both you get the most value from us being there and being able to tune systems properly and make sure that we can get through the most attack methods possible and get those detections in place versus waiting for someone else that's not in the room or to go through a separate change process to get them implemented. Thank you, Dave. Again, uh, one of the next thing is, again, to talk about having a block of time for the appropriate stakeholders. Um, we're there to, to teach and coach the organization on how to detect um, and respond and mitigate these attacks. So ensuring that we have the appropriate stakeholders in the room, is, again, is, is crucial. Um, but not just so that we can teach and coach them, but so that the time isn't bogged down. If we have people come in and go in, it kind of disrupts the, the flow uh, of the purple team. But most importantly, the people, if the people aren't in the room, then they're not getting the, the knowledge or the experience firsthand. And we really love uh, teaching and coaching organizations to be able to detect and respond to these attacks. Um, Last thing is, is how to prepare training. Um, prior to us coming on site, um, obviously we would like to, for the organization to have people have training or know how to use the tools uh, they're doing. Um, Mike, uh, what is the, the number one thing that the blue team could do to start hunting threats on their network um, and to get uh, their training and detection game up and going? That's a great question. Well, a, a couple of things that, that I highly recommend, you know, is uh, getting uh, familiar with, uh, you know, with the tool set. Uh, you know, so 
uh, we we have uh, you know Snort uh, is an open source uh, intrusion detection system. Uh, we have uh, you know the the uh, detection system formerly known as Bro uh, that uh, that is a phenomenal uh, tool set, and, and that's where I would start. I would start with both of those, uh, and uh, you know just literally take a, a, a packet capture. Uh, you know, from either your environment, if you have permission, uh, or, uh, you know, one of the many that are all, uh, available online for you to download, to practice with, uh, and uh, run them through both tools. Snort will only tell you about what it knows or what it thinks uh, is back. Uh, so uh, Snort is a signature-based detection system that looks at, uh, you know, known bad signatures uh, and compares them to the traffic. If it sees a packet with that signature in it, It'll fire. Uh, you know, Bro, uh, you know, the programming language Bro and, and the IDS that, that is based off of it uh, really uh, is about uh, capturing the network traffic, organizing and collating it, uh, and, and then giving that to you in an interface that you can mine uh, for data in. And, and I think that uh, it, it's one of the best tools out there, uh, you know, for uh, essentially going through raw network traffic and hunting for interesting stuff. Uh, you know, look at your DNS entries and start sorting them. Uh, they have uh, filters that look for uh, quote unquote unpronounceable DNS entries. Uh, in other words, uh, DNS entries that were created by a machine. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is going to give you everything that happened on that network during that period of time, not just what one particular tool knew was bad. Uh, and while it can be overwhelming at first, I, I think that's a great way to start, uh, you know, getting into this a little bit more uh, is, is to use something like uh, like Bro IDS. Uh, I believe it's called Zeek now. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, some of us old dogs have, have a hard time uh, changing habits. Uh, but uh, going through and uh, analyzing network events, you know, what does it look like on the wire? What does it look like in the logs? Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things that, that I always encourage my students to do uh, is, uh, you know, to, to find like-minded individuals uh, and start, you know, start by meeting up once a month uh, where, you know, uh, each person brings a virtual machine and some logs or some tools. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe the first month uh, you, you spend uh, essentially setting up those virtual machines and attacking them, uh, sequestering all the logs. And the next month when you meet up, uh, go through and uh, try to analyze uh, the logs and find the things that you already did. Uh, so those, those, those are some of the things that I would say are, are a great way for you to, to essentially start getting your, your, your hunting game up, uh, start uh, upping your detection uh, game. You, you know, you snort as a kind of an introduction into what it knows as being bad. Uh, and then look at it from the other side, from your logs or, or, or from output for some, from something like Bro so that you can uh, essentially see all the rest of the stuff that was happening. Uh, because, you know, uh, uh, you know, in modern attack paths, uh, you know, the way in is only, you know, less than, you know, less than 10%, you know, of the problem, right? They, they got access to your network. Okay, great. Then what did they do? Uh, well, then they harvested all my database and uh, exfiltrated it out over 200 different TCP sessions off to this, you know, third IP address. Uh, well, you know, bro, uh, NetFlow logs and things like that are going to find that, whereas, you know, Snort might have only seen the initial compromise. Rob? Awesome. Thank you very much, Mike. So what do you look for when you're selecting a purple team assessment and training vendor? Well, first thing is you want to find a vendor who has experience. But not just experience in offensive security, but on defense as well, and sysadmin. You want an organization that comes in that has experience with all three, right? Um, next thing is you want to have a vendor who has experience in training individuals. Um, you want uh, a vendor who has the talent to ensure uh, that what you're getting is cutting edge and irrelevant. Um, you want a vendor who has industry leadership, uh, not a fly-by-night vendor who just popped up, uh, will be here for maybe a month or two and then disappear. Lastly, you want 
uh, a vendor who has ethics because um, we're handling sensitive information, we're handling um, the keys to the kingdom, so to say, and you want to make sure that the, the company has ethics surrounding that so that we can guarantee that that um, is not getting out. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? So, so one, well, one last thing, uh, Rob, if I could, uh, you know, this is Mike here. Uh, you know, as as a, an owner of a company that that conducts this type of training, uh, you know that last uh, item about ethics is extremely important. Uh, but it also goes, you know, kind of pervasively through uh, all the rest of that prep uh, that Rob talked about earlier in the slides, right? It's like, well, you know, why do we need to have all these contracts signed, you know, at least a month in advance? Uh, well, you know, it, it's because some of the things that we are doing are uh, illegal uh, if we don't have a contract. Uh, some of the things that we're doing uh, are uh, outside of normal day-to-day -day business operations for an organization, right? Uh, so that's why it's so important that when you're looking for a vendor uh, that is going to conduct any type of offensive uh, uh, operations on your organization, uh, that you choose the correct vendor. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, this is our webinar, and and, and we're going to say that that you know you should go with us, uh, but uh, you know, the, there are a number of, of, of you know, phenomenal organizations out there that, that, that do this type of work. Uh, you know, it, it's really up to you guys to do your research, uh, you know, to make sure that they live up to, uh, you know, what their marketing department says that they do. Thanks, Rob. Awesome. Thanks on, on that, Mike. Uh, we did have one question, and the question was, uh, you only offer email payload testing, no other penetration testing methods. Um, Dave, can you take that question? Sure. Uh, and maybe I'm not sure if maybe things were slightly misunderstood or I wasn't covering things there. Um, we'll start out with edge testing by starting with email, uh, attaching payloads, putting links in there, and we'll start testing other items as well. What happens if there's a USB drive plugged in with a malicious payload? And we'll work through a number of different threats to your organization for that initial infection vector. Uh, so it's not just limited to email. That's what we typically start out with on a purple team. Uh, but we always talk to our clients ahead of time to see what their biggest threat is. What are they most worried about? And we'll work through the, the vectors that are most important to that organization. Yeah, I, I, this is Mike again. I, uh, I remember a while back, uh, you know, uh, back far enough that that uh you know the industry didn't refer to them as as red team penetration tests uh uh yet uh but uh the organization that we were testing literally had no web apps they literally had a tiny externally facing footprint and their primary concerns were around physical access to their organization uh and insider threats uh so you know uh, again as dave and rob said uh, you know, this is about customizing the the training and assessment to your organization uh, and your risk profile. Back to you, Rob. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, is there uh, any other questions from the audience? All right, Mike. Do you want uh, to close us out? Yes, sir. So next slide. So I just wanted to uh, point out a, a little quick reminder here. We do have uh, a uh, executive uh, briefing service. Uh, it's free, sign up. Uh, we uh, will put together a, a short executive briefing uh, on you know, the threats that we think are most relevant this week to look at. Uh, so uh, you know, it, it, our, our promise to you is that it will take no, you know, no longer than five minutes to read and we'll, we will include uh, a number of links uh, so that you can do additional uh, research on your own. And uh, finally, the next slide. Uh, so uh, we've been doing uh, monthly webinars uh, all this year. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the folks that have joined us today uh, and th those that are going to join uh, you know, via video afterwards. Uh, next month's webinar, oh my gosh, this is going to be awesome. Uh, so uh, Jay Beal is going to be presenting his Linux Attack and Defense Episode 9, Sneakers. 
so uh, typically these are on the last Thursday of the month. Uh, next month's webinar is going to be August 29th at 12 p.m. Pacific. Uh, there is a link to register. Uh, you can go to inguardians.com slash webinars. Uh, that's where we list all of our webinars, uh, both uh, the current upcoming ones as well as the ones that have already gone. Uh, so uh, be sure to check those out. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you to our, our, our panelists, uh, myself included, uh, and, uh, and of course to Rob for leading this discussion. Uh, you know, I, I've learned a lot and hopefully uh, you have too. Uh, and and please feel free to uh, email us with any questions or otherwise. Uh, so uh, webinars at inguardians.com. Thank you so much.